All right, welcome back from spring break. It's a beautiful day for iPhone applications. Um, so today has absolutely nothing to do with Angry Birds. I just thought that starting with that would make today seem much more fun. Um, but it is about iOS and about continuing last week's conversation about introducing this coming month's project, which will be your first of two iOS-based applications. Um, I'll try, since it's been a couple of weeks, for some, a couple more weeks, I'll try to um, pepper the group here with some questions so that we can all get back onto the same page as to what some of the concepts are that we've been exploring, as well as uh, what some of the new ideas for today and onward are. So without further ado, we're back in this MVC world. And MVC stands, of course, for Model View Controller, but in English, in a sentence or so, what does that actually mean? Okay. Plus one for me. Carl. So MVC is like this paradigm where you can separate out the logic for um, what you see and your business logic for and okay, good. So it's this paradigm for model for uh, designing software in such a way that you separate your views, your controllers, and your models, which are defined respectively as the aesthetics or the views, uh, the v, uh, the models are your databases or just your data sets. Even though we used MySQL or the like for previous projects, realize that model can really model anything. It can be an XML file, can be a CSV file, it can just be some generic data that's hard coded, but it provides the abstraction that your data is coming from this real world entity or this representation of some data source. And then finally, the controller is sort of the brains behind the whole operation that talks to the uh, models to get some data and then pushes that same data or some transformation thereof to the view. So he's kind of the middleman. And generally, you should not cross these boundaries. So this is taken from Apple's own documentation. And you'll see different depictions of MVC on the internet, depending on the language and the context. And sometimes you will see lines connecting view to model, but generally, that's uh, a bad thing. Generally, all communications should be routed through the more intelligent arbiter known as the controller. So if you're writing code, henceforth, especially in iOS, where you have a view that's talking directly to a model or vice versa, that's probably not the best design. Rather, the controller should be asking for data from the model and then passing it into the view, as this topology here suggests. So try to keep that in mind, and we'll try to provide feedback if we see otherwise during weekly, uh, every few weeks design reviews. So where did we leave off? So we started last week playing with some actual iOS code, and you launch Xcode. Uh, this here is version 4.3.1. The Project 2 specification will make crystal clear exactly what software you should have on your computer so that you don't accidentally start using some old version, your code doesn't work, and the like. So do read that carefully. But here are the templates with which we uh, can begin. So just sanity check. What are these templates exactly? What are these various types of applications you can apparently create? What is it we're choosing here? Ah, Zach. Okay. Yeah, so it's just essentially default sample code that you can start with. They're not so much clean slate since they do actually have code in them, but it essentially means that Apple started with the most minimalist uh, template, which is generally considered empty, empty application, or even something more minimal than that, and just packaged up some code, some nib files, the UI mechanisms that collectively might help you get started writing more uh, interesting apps more quickly. So today, we'll start off with the single view application. And this one's interesting because it actually does give us that MVC framework right out of the the box. So if I go ahead and click on this, I can choose as last uh, time a product name like a demo. Company identifier should just be most anything unique. So flipping around someone's domain name that you own is typically standard practice. We can leave class prefix blank. We'll use iPhone just because it tends to fit on the screen and the projector a little bit better. Storyboards we'll wave our hands at for now. But the second box, use automatic reference counting. Absolutely check this. This is this new uh, fancy feature of the latest version of iOS that Apple introduced last summer. Summer, and it will make your lives easier. Um, if you struggled with things like malloc and free um, in a C-based course, um, realize that these details are now largely hidden from you, at least the free side of things. But in a week or two, we'll peel back this layer and talk about what's actually happening since this notion of automatic reference counting is used in um, other languages that you yourself might have used. And unit tests, we'll start checking, but we'll talk about those in a week or two. Unit tests are classes that you can implement that test other classes that you wrote, so that if you make some change or your partner makes some change, you have some mechanism already written by you to make sure that he or she didn't just break your entire project because he or she um, introduced some bug that causes one of your own tests to fail. So I'll go ahead and click Next. I'm going to go ahead for now and just save it wherever. On my desktop is fine. 
And voila, we have this nice little confusing interface here. So the only thing that's important for now is to take away from this very simple template the, the flow of what code is talking to what, so that when you guys sit down to dive into project two, you actually have a sense of what you should change, where you should begin, and so forth. So let's just expand some of these folders real fast. And there's a whole lot of stuff here, but recall two weeks ago we essentially said ignore many of these, or at least most of these. Um, but a quick tour. Back through this, let's see if we can slide over. Projector is not quite cooperating. There we go. Uh, let's start up here. Main.m. When in doubt, start with the file that's at least most most familiar. So, what kind of code should you be writing in main.m? Okay, good. So none, right? So for the most part, this is the function. Now main is in main.m. Kickstarts the whole process. And to whom does main effectively hand off control of an iOS app? So an app delegate, so which is sort of a generic term describing the notion of a guy who's in charge of, uh, of an application. So it's someone to it's an, a class to whom you delegate control. And where is this coming from? Well, it's a little cryptic here, but syntactically. But argc and argv are familiar. We can ignore nil, which is essentially like null for now. But this fourth argument to UI application main is essentially informing this class, that's, uh, this function that's called UI application main, to whom control should now be handed off. What file should now take over this application? So app delegate is actually the name of a class. The keyword class is a message that we're passing into that class, which is to say that class, C-L-A-S-S -S here, is a class method or an instance method. So it's a class method. Why do we know it's a class method? And apologies for the confusion of the names here that we're talking about a class that's also a class method. Why do you know it's a class method? Exactly. There's no instance. We didn't call alloc, which means we didn't allocate a class, which means we must be passing a message to just the class name itself. So alloc is a class method. Class happens to be a class method. And you can perhaps guess, what does it return? So it returns a, well, it returns a representation of that class that you can then pass to another function, nsString from class, which is going to convert app delegate to quote unquote app delegate. Now, why the heck did we just jump through all these hoops when we could have just hard coded quote unquote app delegate? It's a little more generic way of doing this. So for now, though, you can ignore what's going on in main.m because all that matters is that control has now been passed off to app delegate.hn.m. Yeah? Ah, so even so, Objective C is a proper superset of C, which means it still starts off in procedural style using a traditional main method. The OO layer was added on top of C. Good question. All right, so let's turn our attention now to app delegate.h. So when in doubt as to what's going on with something, generally I would start with the .h file before diving into the .m file. But let's see what's now in this file. So all of this is boilerplate code that we were given. So what's interesting here? Well, what does uikit.h refer to? What's likely inside of that file? Yeah, so declarations, so C style declarations of things like UI button, UI view, UI slider, UI dot dot dot, a whole bunch of UI mechanisms that we started to see two weeks ago in the uh, WYSIWYG editor that let us drag and drop things like buttons. All right, uh, let's skip the second line for now. Um, at interface app delegate colon UI responder and so forth. Does someone want to translate that one line into slightly less technical English? What is that line doing? Yeah. OK, uh, UI, uh, close. Flip your story around a little bit. Uh, flip the other possible way. <laughs> OK, <laughs> someone want to tweak? You're on the right track. Just got the order reversed. Yeah. So Yellow. Good. OK, so app delegate is the class we are declaring in this file. It descends from UI responder, which is apparently some class that Apple wrote that presumably has something to do with responding to UI stuff, touches and drags and presses and so forth. And the angled brackets there denotes a protocol, aka interface in PHP or Java. And this has declared in it some methods, foobar and baz. And the fact that there is this angle bracket notation here says that this class, app delegate, that we are implementing promises to implement the methods that are declared in that 
protocol, aka interface. So essentially, read it left to right. I'm declaring this, it descends from this, and also I will implement these additional methods that are presumably not in the parent class. That's why I'm specifying them as a protocol. All right, any questions? Well, let's close the declaration. At n just means end of that. So now let's look inside of the class. These two things. So, what is a property in Objective C? What's a property? And what's its relationship, say, with an instance variable? Yeah? So, a property, like, in some sort of way, like, containing the data so you can control how it's accessed and how it's utilized. Okay. Because, like, let's say, like, an atomic access, so it has to be all done at one time. Okay, good. Okay, good. So to summarize for camera here, property is essentially like a wrapper for an instance variable. And an instance variable, meanwhile, is a piece of data that's inside of some object. And it's a wrapper in the sense that you can control how that piece of data is accessed and also set by way of the creation of things that are generally called getters and setters or um, accessors and mutators, which no one really says, but every textbook says it. Yeah, Jason. You can also use dot. Yes, so this is another compelling feature syntactically of properties is that it allows you to start using dot notation. So that if you want to access some member uh, bar of an object foo, normally you would say something like this, or rather, oops, that's the method syntax. If we say foo arrow bar, sort of C style, this would get us the instance variable called bar. But the fact that we now have properties means we can slightly simplify this to foo dot bar, which is not a huge leap. You're saving one keystroke, which isn't all that compelling. But when you call it this way, what are you inducing when you access bar in this way? Jason? You're, uh, you're, passing, you're essentially doing a message, so whether it's getting or setting. Good. So you're actually invoking the method. You're passing a message known as bar to this, which is invoking the getter in this case. Or if we happen to have an equal sign over here, then you're invoking the setter. And the setter, by convention, has to be called what? For an example like this. Set in the uppercase of the instance variable. Name. Set bar. So this is a convention in Objective C. And you can override these defaults. But generally, this means your getter should be called bar and your setter should be called set bar. All right, so back to the story at hand. So we now have two properties here. One is called window, one is called UI controller. So let's take a look at this one. UI window just refers essentially to the rectangular glass. So the, uh, in this template, you have some pre configured code and a pre configured nib, an XIB file, which is the user interface. And somehow Apple has pre configured you with a pointer called window that's apparently going to point to the actual window on the screen so that you can actually control it and put stuff there. Strong and non atomic, we'll come back to strong, but this somehow relates for now to pointers. Non-atomic just means that you're not writing multi-threaded code here. If you actually said that this is an atomic property, Apple or Xcode would add some additional source code to the getters and setters so that you're accessing this variable bar or window atomically. And long story short, that's just not necessary. And if you haven't taken 161 or 61 and aren't quite familiar with atomicity or threading, don't worry. We'll come back to that, um, but not in much detail in this class. All right, and how about this one here? View controller, what is a view controller? Yeah, Dan. Good, very good. It controls the view. All right. So what does that really mean? So this is the C in MVC. Apple slightly confusingly calls these things view controllers, but it's just controller, really, um, but specifically a controller that's designed to operate on a view. And this pointer is going to be the mechanism via which the app delegate Recall, which is the class that at this moment in the story is in charge of the application, is somehow going to further pass control of the application onto code that you wrote. So this is an oversimplification, but generally you won't write much code in your app delegate. Most of the code that you write, certainly for project two, will be isolated to your own view controllers, your own models. If it's the app delegate that ultimately hands control off to something that you really have written yourself. And that's an oversimplification in that we'll see in a second there are some methods in app delegate that you yourself might want to implement. But those relate to things like backgrounding and force quitting and the ability to actually save really important state before the user hits the home button or turns off the phone or something along those lines. So any questions about this M file? Do speak up. No dumb questions. If you're confused now, the rest of the class is not going to be that useful. Anything at all? 
All right, so in the M file, thankfully, it's mostly comments. All right, let me close this window on the right hand side. All the green is comments, but these are the methods. We'll call them stubs. Stubs in that they're really just placeholders that you can delete entirely or start filling in these blanks. And these fairly long named methods are things you can implement that, again, implement some low level iOS functionality. How to handle backgrounding, how to handle forced termination. What's nice about iOS is that it allows you, the dev, a last minute opportunity to quickly save state, to quickly close a database connection, any maintenance that you might want to do so that the application. Next time it starts, maybe resumes where you left off.、Um, it can all be done at this particular place. But code controlling your views, talking to your model, doesn't generally belong here. Because the method that you might tweak on occasion、um, is this first one. So, this, the name of this method, here's a little quiz question. What is the name of this method? Yeah, or the, yes. Application did finish launch. Good. And if you're writing this in prose, you would actually include the trailing colon. So, this kind of detail you'll start seeing in the documentation. So, that's the name of this method or the selector,、um, which is uh, uh, similar but different. We'll get back to those before long. So, what's going on here? So, there's not all that much commenting. Apple put a comment here, which is essentially an instruction to you, the developer, put stuff that you want to add to this here. But what are these other lines doing? Well, on the right hand side,、um, let, actually, rather than me keep talking, What's this doing in the square brackets here? Allocates memory for a UI window. Perfect. Allocates memory for a UI window. So it specifically instantiates that object. In it with frame, this is now like the constructor that class, languages like PHP and Java have.、Um, and what is it doing? Well, it's initializing it with something as, known as a frame. Think of it as a picture frame, it's some rectangular、uh, dimensions. Where are we getting that frame from? Well, UI screen, main screen. Is what kind of method? What kind of method is main screen apparently? Class or instance? So it's apparently a class method because, again, there's no mention of alloc, and I have no mention of UI screen until this moment in time. So UI screen must be a class, and passing in main screen's message means give me some kind of pointer or reference to the so called screen. So another representation of the glass. Bounds essentially returns the dimensions of that screen. So what we're saying in this whole line here to the right of the equal sign, allocate a window and put, uh, tell that window that your bounds are from here to here, or whatever the shape of the device actually is. Is. On the right hand side, what is this doing? Self.window equals. So it's setting the property called window inside of self, my app delegate object, to that value, but more specifically, the dot notation in the equal sign means what method is getting called or what message is actually being passed. Jason? Set window. So there is somewhere underneath the hood a method called set window that was probably automatically synthesized, written for us, not manually, so that this setting from right to left would happen. Jason? So is this、um, essentially, this is like the bound. If you're working on an iPhone, it's the dimensions of the iPhone screen, but if you're, is that what this is? Exactly. It's the、or、bounds、iPad. of the iPhone or the iPad screen. Or if you're mirroring like the TV or whatever.、So、yes. That's another notion of a window. You can have another, or rather, another notion of a screen can be an external via、uh, Wi Fi or physical cable. Connection. Exactly. So, for the most part, this is boilerplate. You rarely change this until you start doing fancy things like projecting videos on the screen to some other screen, doing mirroring, or the like. Yeah? Since UI window is being allocated, it has to be an instance method. Good question. Since UI window is being allocated, it has to be an instance method. Not quite. Alloc itself is a class method because it's being passed to a class before anything's been instantiated. But in it with frame is what type of method? Instance or class? Instance, because it is being passed, albeit in nested form, to what is now an existing object that was returned from that message pass. And just、um, to go back to three weeks ago, when we first started talking about Objective C, suppose you're out of memory, and suppose that the alloc call for UI window fails, what gets returned? So, nil gets returned. So, this seems bad, right? In 50, one of the most common causes for bugs, especially around PSET 6 time, dictionary, is seg faults, right? When you're dereferencing bogus pointers. But that's not going to happen here. What happens if you nonetheless call init with frame sort of blindly on what apparently could be nil? What happens? It ignores the message. So, this is a huge value add of this notion of nil as opposed to null, in that if you pass messages to nil, things won't crash. They will simply be silently ignored. And this allows us to eliminate a whole lot of error checking, for better or for worse, and this nesting of messages so that we can just pass and pass and pass, irrespective of whether we get back nil. We can check for nil, in fact, at the very end if we really want to,、uh, if self.window itself is nil. 
All right, so moving on, view controller. So this is essentially the same story, but the instance method we're now calling to initialize what's apparently called a view controller is in it with nib name. What's a nib? Yeah. So it's a, user, it's a file containing a user interface. It's the WYSIWYG stuff that we saw two weeks ago. Underneath the hood, it's implemented with a file extension called XIB. The useless history there is that it used to be Next Step Interface Builder, NIB. When the tool became Xcode, it became XIB. But you pronounce XIB nib. So for historical reasons. All right, so what, else, what is going on here? This is now assigning a pointer to self.viewcontroller to whatever code it is apparently that I am going to now write in this application in the thing that's actually called viewcontroller.m and .h. Um, this next line here, root view controller gets self view controller. So apparently inside of a UI window, there is a property that's called UI, uh, root view controller, and it does what it says. This is a property that should be set to whatever view controller should kickstart the whole application. Who should be now handed control of this application? Make key invisible just means make this the key window, which means start responding to uh, finger touches on the screen, make it visible is obvious, and then I return yes, signifying that all is well. So rarely should you need to touch this particular code, at least for uh, initial applications, but realize that's what now hands control off to you. All right, any questions? All right, so what actually the last files will care about then are in these here, viewcontroller.h. Phew, not all that much here. This simply says, um, Kevin, do you want to take a stab at this here? What is this declaring? Um, sorry. No, I'm not picking, just feels like now we'll come full circle. Perfect. So I'll tweak one word. Instead of instance, we're declaring a class called viewcontroller that does everything you just said, that inherits all of the instance variables and methods of a parent class called UI view controller. Perfect. So by default, this template gives you this framework, but it doesn't put anything in there. We can put whatever we'd like in there. In the M file, there's similarly not all that much going on. These are mostly just stubs. And view did load is the method that's going to be called when this view controller's view comes into the screen comes into view. Um, and view did unload is when it disappears. So what does this mean? Well, when you load up an iPhone application that has a UI on the main page, it's going to, that's the notion of the view being loaded. And this method gets called as soon as you see something on the screen. If, however, you hit a button and that screen kind of flips around like this, or it drops away, or something goes on top of it, iOS reserves the right to reclaim all of the memory that was being used by that view, at which point view did unload might be called. So this is to say that views in iOS are very fragile. They are meant only to present information. They should not be used to store information. Any kind of information like high scores that are on the screen or the state of the game that you're playing on the screen should be displayed through the view, but you should absolutely still have copies of that information. The high score, whatever the state of the game board is, or whatever it is you're implementing should be stored where else besides the view. In, in the model, right? Or maybe some of the data is actually uh, currently remembered in the controller, but they should not be stored only in the view. This is to say that as soon as you change screens, all the hard work you just did assembling the UI might be thrown away. So you have to be able to reconstruct it the next time view did load is called. And again, for an iOS app, think of like the stock application, the clock application, any simple application that has a button that then changes the screen to look completely different. That might mean that everything you previous law is evicted from RAM. It's pushed off the stack altogether. All right, so there's really nothing else of interest going on in here. So let's actually go back to an interesting application that does something. So recall that we left off at the very end of class before break with this application. So let me go ahead and run it with Command R. We're going to go ahead and see a little simple ATM that looks like this. All right, so a little bit of review then. What was an IB action? Yes, Dan. It's what happens when you click one of those buttons. OK, good. It's what happens when you click a button, or more generally, do something with a UI uh, widget that's on the screen. IB action is a method that could be called when, again, you do something with the interface. What's an IB outlet? Also from two weeks back. Yeah? Can that send the other way? It's the other direction. Yeah. So it goes like two, it changes. 
Good. So an IB outlet is essentially it's generally a pointer that you declare in your .h file. And that pointer then allows you to have a virtual connection to something physical that you see on the screen. So in other words, if you want to be able to talk to the text area at the very top of the screen so you can update the account balance, or even higher up if you want to be able to update the, the numbers that the user has typed in, you need some way in code of talking to this drag and drop WYSIWYG interface that you created. So how you do that, you declare a pointer as an IB outlet so that you can do that dragging and dropping last time. So let's make this more concrete. In my nib file, and there's only one here, viewcontroller.nib, we created rather quickly this interface here last time. So let me go ahead and scroll over and let's see what we did here. So this was a UI view. Um, what was this? Let's see. This is a UI label. So remember that I drag something like this. I then drag these bars outward like this and so forth. And this gave us a deposit. Uh, whoops. This gave us this label here. All right. So quick, silly tour of what's going on on the right-hand side, just so everyone's on the same page. Um, I'm guessing um, you don't remember the name of the class that this label is. All right, so how do you figure this out? Right? How do you go about understanding an application you've been handed or something your partner did? Well, along the top-hand side of all of these inspectors here, as they're called, there's a whole bunch of little icons. This, for instance, is the attributes inspector, which if you hover over it long enough, you should see the little uh, tooltip that says as much. This generally touches things like the aesthetics of the thing, the colors, the font size, and the like. This one here is the identity inspector, and this will tell me exactly what class I have dragged and dropped onto the interface. So what is Interface Builder doing? What is this drag and drop interface really doing for us? Instead of you having to write dozens of lines of code, allocking a UI label, allocating 9 or 12 different UI buttons, you are telling Xcode to do all of that code generation for you by simply having dragged and dropped these various, WYSIWYG, uh, these various UI mechanisms wherever you want them to actually be on the screen. So in short, this drag and drop interface is by no means requisite. You can write an iPhone app without ever touching it, it just becomes a lot more tedious because you have to say alloc a UI button. Put this button at 10 pixels, comma 14 pixels so that it goes right there. And then you have to do the same thing for this button and this button and this button. So in short, it gets very tedious, at least to lay out something like this. So Interface Builder, certainly for Project 2, is a way of simplifying your life. But you'll also find that it hides certain details. And those details are often hidden behind these things called IB outlets and IB actions. So what do we mean by this? Well, let me go ahead and right click onto the UI label. And notice that a whole bunch of stuff comes up, um, only one of which is relevant right now. This up top there says referencing outlets. And on the left, it says deposit label. And on the right, it says files owner. So what does that actually mean? Well, let's scroll over to the right-hand side of the interface here and notice that any time you use Interface Builder, this drag and drop interface, you always get mentions of files owner, first responder, and then a list of objects, everything you've already dragged and dropped into the interface. If I go ahead and right click uh, or click once on files owner and then look over to the right at that same identity inspector, who owns this nib file apparently? So a class called ViewController. So there's the relationship. We have ViewController.h, we have ViewController.m, and there's this ViewController.nib. What code is it that's supposed to be allowed to talk to this UI, this nib file? It's apparently ViewController. So ViewController.h and .m. So now on the right, left-hand side, what is the file's owner? It's the ViewController class. So if I right-click here, there's actually a whole bunch of complexity here at the moment. And we see things like balance label, deposit label, which may sound vaguely familiar from a couple of weeks back. And then all of these digits, all of these buttons. So rather than dive back deep into this ATM that we've implemented quite qu uh, quickly, let's start off with something that's much simpler. So I'm going to go ahead and close this. Stop tasks, which means just kill the simulator there. I'm going to go ahead into Xcode, uh, create a new single view application. I'm going to go ahead and call this one nib1 for version 1. I'm going to leave everything else checked as we did before. I'm going to go ahead and save this on my desktop. And now let's go ahead and do the following. So this is the story we started telling with the template before. Let me go ahead and change the background of this like we did last time. So I've clicked on the boring gray background. I click on the attributes inspector at top right. I click on background and we'll make it something hideous like red 
and then dismiss this by clicking on the graph paper. So that now is the start of my app. Now I've got all these little widgets here, and you should see familiar UI mechanisms in the bottom right corner, like toggles and switches and the like. Let me go ahead and drag a text field up here. I'm going to go ahead and drag it to make it bigger over here. I'm going to go ahead and make it bigger over here. And then I'm going to go ahead and put a button. So I want to make a fairly simple iOS application that allows me to type in my name. Then I click Go, and it's going to say hello to me. And through this simple application, can we start wiring together the UI with our code and vice versa so that then we can go back to the ATM and in turn Project 2 to start building more sophisticated tools altogether? So I'm going to add some simple little placeholder text here in the Attributes Inspector. So now it says Name. So it's a little more clear as to what's going on. All right, so what do I actually want to do next? Well, in Nib 1, and let me play along in a manner consistent with code that you can play with after. In Nib 1, let me go ahead and declare a couple of things in my view controller. So let me go over to my view controller. Dot H and dot M. My goal right now is to be able to listen to when the user has typed in their name into that text box and then hit the go button so that I can pop up a little JavaScript style alert that says, hi, David, or hi, so and so. So this means I need to somehow respond to the button press and I need to somehow programmatically be able to talk from code to the text field so I can see what the user actually typed in. So on the one hand, button press sends a message uh, to an IB action. On the other hand, I need to be able to check from code what the user actually typed into the text field. So we get one IB action and one IB outlet. So let me go ahead here in my properties, or rather in my header file, and I'm going to go ahead and say give me a property that's going to be non-atomic because I don't care about threading. It's going to be strong, which is a detail we'll come back to. But it's going to be an IB outlet that is pointing to a UI text field. And this text field will be called, say, text field. So in other words, this is a pointer that I'm putting in code that's going to allow me to talk to my GUI, specifically the text field up at top. All right. Next, I'm going to say, you know what? This same class, view controller, has to have a method that's going to get invoked when the user touches that button. So I'm going to specify that it's indeed an IB action, which means this is a method that might be called because of some GUI interaction. I'm going to call it simply go, and I'm going to say that it takes a pointer to a generic um, object called sender. So recall that ID is like void star. It refers to some Objective C object. And we'll just generically call it sender to be consistent with IB actions. All right, so now I actually have to implement this stuff. So let me go ahead and copy the declaration here, go into my M file. I really don't know or don't care about these methods right now, so I'm just going to delete that. I don't need this because this is just placeholder code, so let me further eliminate this. Should auto rotate to interface orientation, I'm going to leave that alone. So by default, this will only support one orientation. I'm going to go ahead and paste this in here, and now I have to implement the functionality that's going to get executed when the user touches that button. But first, let's go back to my nib file. So my nib file is already ready to go, got my user interface, I've got the beginnings of my source code, now I have to have these things somehow talk to one another. So I can do this in a couple of ways. I can either right click on files owner and I see this. Notice now that because I declared a text field, it now appears in this list and there's nothing connected to it. Notice there's no gray shading, there's no filling in the circle on the right hand side. There is some stuff here, view, I didn't do any of that, that was handed to me by the template, but the fact that this says text field means I can somehow link these two. Similarly, if I go over here and right click on name, notice that I see a whole list of possible events that can get triggered as a result of a user doing something with a text field. And the only one I care about is going to be related to did end on exit or edit, some notion of editing having happened. So I'm going to go ahead and do a bit of a leap of faith and I'm going to hold control and drag from that text field to files owner, and this little blue line happens as by default, if I let go, I then see a list of the things that I can connect this to. But here I've gone in the wrong direction. So that was actually unintentional, but I tried to work it into the story. So here I've gone into the wrong direction, right? I actually want to be able to talk from my code to the interface, to the text field. So I actually need to tell this story in reverse. So I'm going to drag control from files owner to the text field, then let go, and OK, there's my outlet. I am effectively plugging my code by way of files owner, which is just a silly icon that represents your code, 
into this widget by way of the text field outlet. So, what does this really mean? I've got this pointer declared in viewcontroller.h. I have not assigned that pointer any value. And in fact, I'm not going to because Apple's going to do that for me. Simply by having created that blue line from one to the other, when this application is launched and when that、uh, user interface is constructed in memory, Apple or Xcode is going to go ahead and assign to this property text field literally the pointer address in memory of wherever that text field ended up. So all of that happens for me. I don't need to do it myself with alloc or anything like that. So now if I go back to my nib file, I also want to do something with go. So when the user clicks go, I'm going to hold control again, drag to files owner and let go. What events do I want to send? Well, go. So I want to go ahead and say, when you touch that button, Go ahead and trigger the method go. So now let's do a quick sanity check. In my M file, I had to do for a, mo a moment ago. Let's go ahead and do ns log, and I am here. So just a little sanity check before we actually do something here.、Uh, method. Oh, and we actually need to do this at synthesize. And how do we go about synthesizing that text view property? Well, recall that we did this. And then we specified go ahead and back this with an instance variable called underscore text field. So that line there is what gives me the getters and setters that makes the property work. As an aside, why the underscore and the equal sign? What's the point of this? I could ignore that altogether and just say this, and the getter and setter would be synthesized. But what does this do for me? So now it doesn't set it as private per se, but it does create an instance variable called what? Underscore text field. So, this is again just a human convention. It's just useful in your code to be able to distinguish private instance variables from actual method names and the like. So, this underscore convention, and do use one, not two, which is generally reserved for the compiler, simply is a visual cue to you and your partner that this is some seemingly private instance variable that should be accessed probably via a property. So, just a convention. All right, let me go ahead and run this now. And. The simulator pops up. Let me go ahead and open the debugging window by clicking this icon on the bottom. And let me go ahead and click Go. And voila, my code did in fact get executed. So now let's make this application more interesting than actually just having、uh, this little silly NS string. So let's go ahead and do this. First, I want to go ahead and show an actual alert, sort of JavaScript style. So I'm going to declare an NS string, star s gets NS string, and we're going to go string with format. Um, it can get a little confusing with the autocomplete, but most of these methods become familiar over time. Let me close this window here to give us more room. So, string with format, I'm going to say something like hello, comma, at,、uh, let's say, whoops, percent at, and then exclamation point, close quote, comma, self dot text field dot text. So, what is this line of code doing? We've not seen quite this line before. But take a guess as to what it's doing. Left hand side, sort of C style, we've declared a pointer called s to an object of type ns string. What's going on on the right hand side? Carl?、Oh, um, Don't stretch. It's just making a string with formatting、uh, where you plug in the text field's text into the percent at place. Okay. And then it becomes a string hello, whatever the text field is. Okay, perfect. So ns string is again a class, which apparently implies that string with format is what kind of method? Instance or class method? So, it's a class method. And this is what's generally known as a convenience method, which is something that does alloc for you, so you don't have to do alloc and then an init. So, string with format creates a string, sort of like printf, with that formatting. Percent at means put an ns string here, not a char star. And then, comma, self dot text field. Well, what, why did I say dot text at the end? Why would this be wrong? Perfect. So, self dot text field would induce the getter for. That te UI text field object, and we don't want to plug an object into the string. We want to plug the actual string. So, just like in JavaScript, you have DOM elements that have dot value properties. Similarly, here is their dot text, which literally returns a string representation of whatever the user typed into that string. Now, take a guess. Why is Xcode yelling at me with this yellow triangle for this one line of code, which is syntactically correct now? Yeah. 
exactly. It's a warning, not an error. It just means I haven't actually used S. So let's go ahead and use S. I'm going to go ahead now and declare a UI alert view, which is kind of like a pop up, as we'll soon see. I'm going to call it alert, a pointer there too. And then I'm going to assign it the result of calling UI alert view. I'm going to go ahead and alloc one of these objects. And then I'm going to go ahead and init with title. And this is going to be messy briefly. Quote unquote, hello. Then I'm going to go ahead and say a message of S. Then I'm going to go ahead and say a delegate of nil. And I'll clean this up in a second. A cancel button title of quote unquote thanks. And a cancel other, bu rather, other button titles of just nil. All right. Uh, what did I miss? Uh, there we go. Thank you. Whoops. That's why it was all messy there for a second. All right. And then here, done. OK. So it got a little messy there. But we can line, what's wrong here? Delegate here. Okay. So this Xcode does this for you. Notice how all the colons line up? That's an attempt to make it more readable. Um, what is the name, as an aside, of this method? Um, this name of this method is init with title, message, delegate, cancel, button, title, other button titles, colon. So that's the name of this method. All right, so what's actually going on here? First, let's go ahead and spoil the results and actually see this thing in action. I need to call one other thing. I need to say alert show. Now I have hopefully a working application. So let me go ahead and rerun this. Let me go ahead and boot this up here. Let me go ahead and now click in the text field. And notice by default it pulls up the keyboard. That's default behavior that you get for free by using a UI text view. I'm going to go ahead and type David and click go. And hello, David. So what's inside of this alert view now? So notice the title is indeed hello. The button that's going to cancel this thing just says thanks. And then we have some kind of placeholder here, which is literally plugged in that value. So what's going on over here? So UI alert view is a class. We've allocated an object uh, using this class method. We're then calling what's effectively a constructor with a whole bunch of arguments, one of which is the title, one of which is the method we want passed, uh, the message we want to display. A delegate will come back to. A delegate will see is an object that's going to be informed when I click that thanks button to dismiss it. So you have this way of actually listening for events after you've pulled up something like this. Cancel button title is obviously that button string. And then other buttons title, if you wanted to have an OK or cancel, those kinds of buttons, you can embed them with a comma separated list right there. All right, so any questions about what we just did here? Well, let's do one other nicety. Let me go ahead and click thanks. I feel like it'd be nice to kind of clean things up, like getting rid of the keyboard. So realize that we can also do things like this. So as soon as this go method is called, I can pass a message to the text field that resigns, rather, resigns first responder status. So this is a general notion that you'll see throughout iOS. First responder, much like in the medical world, refers to the person who got to the scene first. And in this case, if you touch the text area, the keyboard's going to come up because the text field was the first thing, apparently to respond to that key press. Um, that is to say, if you had things layered on top of one another on the UI, whoever responds first is the so-called first responder. If I pass this message called resign first responder to the object called uh, text, uh, text field, that's going to send it a message saying, uh-uh, there's nothing to see here. Undo whatever you just did. And what did it do? It triggered the keyboard to come up. So now, by responding, resigning first responder status, if I recompile and rerun this, I'll actually see that the keyboard should, which is slightly aesthetically more interesting, now goes away. So another example of passing a message, this time uh, involving the notion of first responder status. And suppose next, I feel like this app could be a little better. Right? It's underwhelming, admittedly. <laughs> but if I click thanks, be nice if I could somehow clear the name David that's still now lingering. And I'm going to have to, if I want to play this game again, I have to click in the text view and hit delete, 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 delete. Let's see if we can actually make this a little better. So I somehow want to be able to listen for the user touching that button so as to respond to them subsequently by clearing the name David automatically. So I need to tweak one thing here. I'm going to go into my H file, and I'm going to say, you know what? Rather than just declare a class called ViewController that inherits everything from UI ViewController, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and promise to implement a UI alert view delegate protocol. So in other words, I've read the documentation on the things called UI alert views. And the documentation told me that, hey, by the way, if you implement this protocol and one or more of its methods, you can then respond to messages that the alert view might send 
back to you. In other words, I was dismissed. The user clicked thanks. So I have to specify that I'm uh, going to implement that protocol. And then I just need to implement one other thing. Let me go ahead and actually hold Option. And I don't remember what the syntax is, so I'm going to hold Option here. I'm going to click on this thing. And now notice a little pop-up comes up that reminds me what this thing does. Uh, here's the reference. So let me go ahead and click that. And it should open the documentation. And indeed, if I implement this protocol, notice that I could implement now any one or any more of these methods. And among them are, let's see, uh, alert view did dismiss with button index. So that's the one I care about. That is the message that if I implement support for, will be passed to me saying the user clicked thanks. The user dismissed that alert view. So let's go ahead and just see a little more detail. Let me click on that in the documentation. And sure enough, it just confirms that. So it tells me that if I implement this, I have to pass in a pointer to the alert view. I have to pass in, or rather, I will be passed a pointer to the alert view object. And I will be passed an in NS integer, 0, 1, 2, 3. If you had a UI alert view that had multiple buttons, like OK and cancel, you'd be told this is 0, this is 1, this is 2, and so forth. This tells me exactly what these are uh, doing in more detail. So let's go ahead and try to implement this. Let me go back to my H file. I've definitely declared that I'm implementing this protocol. Now I'm going to go into my M file, and I'm going to implement only that one method. It's an instance method according to the documentations. It's void. It's called alert view uh, colon. And now I have to pass it, uh, rather, I have to declare it in exactly the same way. So let me go ahead and do UI. Let's go ahead and just copy paste. Let's go here. All right, let's go back into here. Paste that in here. UI alert view did dismiss with button index. Put this here. All right, and just as a sanity check, we'll do the whole ns log thing again. So ns log at, whoops, ns log at here, save. All right, so let's now do this. Run, stop, run, and here we go. Very exciting. Let's open up the debugging window so we can see the amazing new feature. Go, and then thanks, and I screwed up. All right. Uh, what's that? Oh, yes. Perfect. Thank you. So another example that was not meant to be part of the discussion, but it's a good pedagogical trick. So what did I do wrong? So according to Tommy, um, the key actually is in, or sorry, oh, no, RJ. My apologies. So as RJ noticed, we've forgotten to t inform this uh, object, the UI alert object, to whom it should send this message once that button has been clicked. And indeed, when I first implemented this very long name method here, or rather called this very long name method, notice that for delegate, I said nil. But in fact, if I am implementing this response inside of myself, using UI alert view did dismiss with button index. I can't just say that there's a nil delegate, because then a message is going to get passed to nil. Nothing's going to happen, case in point, per the demo. But if I instead want that message to be passed to me, I simply say self. And recall that self is like this in PHP or Java. So now let me go ahead and recompile, rerun this code. And now hopefully that message should get sent to me. I'll open the debugging window in the background, type my name, type go, all is well, and then thanks. And there, it's actually called this time. So how do I actually now do something that's more interesting? I can do self dot text field uh, dot text gets nil, and this will essentially clear the text field. So now, if I rerun this application and I type in my name, then type go and then thanks. Notice, watch the name David. It has now disappeared. Very amazing. I'll make this available for download after class. <laughs> Let's go ahead and take a five minute break. When we come back, we'll look at ATM and then project two. All right, so we are back. And the teaser for project two is this. For project two, you and your partner will be implementing a so-called utility application, which means it's an iOS application with two sides, a main side and then a flip side. And on the main side is where users will be able to play not quite Hangman, but rather evil Hangman. Uh, those of you unfamiliar with Hangman, it's a game where the computer picks a word from a dictionary, and then you have some number of guesses letter by letter to figure out what the computer is thinking of. It's an incredibly mind-numbing game once you are our age or your age, um, sadly my age. Um, but Evil Hangman 
is much more exciting. And in fact, it's a great game to play with your roommates or have them play it because in Evil Hangman, the computer cheats. Rather than committing to a pseudo randomly chosen word at the beginning of the game, it instead chooses a length for a word, and then that's it. And then it looks at its dictionary of all possible words, thousands of words, and the user proceeds to guess a letter, like the letter E. What does the computer then do? It then scours its dictionary, eliminates all words that actually have the letter E in them, and says, nope, there are no E's in this word. So then you get a strike against you, and you have a finite number of strikes. And so then the, you, the human, get to play again, and you choose like an A. And the computer looks through its list of non E words, further eliminates any words that,、uh, ha- that don't have E's, and、uh, eliminates words that have A's. So, as to shrink the list of all possible words even smaller, so that it can then say to you, nope, no A's in this word either. Now, mind you, the computer still doesn't know what that word is going to be. It's constantly trying to evade your guesses. And at some point, after some number of guesses, the computer's probably going to have to make a commitment because you're going to say the letter N. And just by chance, all the words that it has left in its data bank have the letter N in them. So, it has to choose which,、uh, which of those words. Or rather, what location of n to reveal. So it looks through its list of words, that have, all of which unfortunately have n, but n might be here or here or here. So the computer has to decide fine, n will be here, and then further whittles its, down, its list of words down to only those words that have n in that location, but no a's and no e's. Now, meanwhile, the tick that's.、Um, The clock is ticking, and you're guessing wrong, guessing wrong, guessing wrong. So, odds are you, the human, are going to lose. And indeed, when you actually see this game played and watch your roommates' reactions, the word almost always ends up being something ridiculously obvious, like puppy. It's just so, it's such that you never actually guessed any letters that were in such an obvious word, like puppy. And that's simply because the computer is evading, evading, evading. So, it's a great way of making your roommates feel really stupid when playing your、uh, CS 164 project. <laughs> So, that's the game you're going to implement. We'll talk a bit more technically about how you'll go about wiring it up, but realize that there'll be a walkthrough for the project spec this Wednesday. So, do realize that even though project one is due this Friday, the proposal for two, which, and recall that the proposal means read the spec, do just the bit bucket stuff, and decide between you and your partner who's going to do what for this project, because the design document and style guide will be due next week. All right, so let's turn our attention then back to Xcode and take some steps toward doing something like That. So, recall that we left off last time with this ATM, which I didn't want to do before that more fun app just now because there's a lot more going on. But it's a lot of copy paste, really, recall, because we have a lot of buttons, all of which do effectively the same thing send a message to the view controller indicating what button was pressed. But let's see if we can't tease this apart now because realize, especially with Objective C, which is new to most people, your partner is going to be writing some code, you're going to be writing some code, and he or she is also going to be doing stuff with nib files potentially. So, being able to understand what someone else has done, whether it's me, Or Tommy, the TFs, or your partner is actually quite important. So, do keep in mind the various tricks and the clicking and the right clicking that will reveal to you exactly what is going on in an iOS application. So, recall that this is where we left off two weeks ago with the ATM. And recall that this example introduced a little more than just a view controller and the app delegate. I manually created two files called account.h and account.m. Because, much like our discussions weeks ago of MVC, I wanted an M in this application, a model that represents. Represented a user's account balance. Now, I could just have a global variable or some kind of instance variable inside of my view controller, but that didn't feel quite right, and it shouldn't feel right to you. The view controller should be about talking to model, talking to view, but not necessarily storing a whole lot of state itself, at least not state that could be represented with an entity like an account. So, recall that I declared a very simple class called account. And in this, I simply said that account descends from NS object. It has no instance variables per se. So, in fact, I didn't necessarily need the curly braces. That too is valid syntax. But it will have a property. So, in fact, it will have an instance variable. It's just going to get automatically synthesized for me. And I decided that an account in the bank sense has a balance. And it's going to be unsigned because I don't care about going negative. And I want it to be a 64 bit number. So, I said long, long. And then I specified that it's a property, non atomic. And a sign, again for now, a sign we will almost always use with primitives like longs,、um, whereas we used strong earlier with pointers. So we'll get back to that in a week or two as to why the distinction for now we'll use a sign. So inside of account, there wasn't all that much going on. 
But I did have an init method. So inside of this init method, I declared that a balance by default should be 0. Why all of this if and whatnot? So this is just convention. Anytime you init, anytime you write your own init method, you should generally call your parent class's init method, as implied by self gets super init, just in case someone above you needs to do some work on this object first, namely the NS object implementation. Then you can do whatever you want. Then you should return self. So if and when you write your own init methods, they should almost follow this paradigm where you implement the stuff between the curly braces. And you can also have custom init methods if you actually wanted to take in arguments like this. But for now, it's just init. And notice that I don't actually have getters or setters implemented here, even though I'm presumably going to want to get and set a user's account balance. So why is this class so simply implemented? What, where is my getter and setter? Synthesize. Yeah, so in synthesize, I'm going to get that for uh, automatically. So this, recall, synthesizes that property, but also creates the getter and setter that will allow me to access a property called balance. So in other words, as a result of that line, I can either access a user's balance with a, uh, let's call this an A object. If I've done, uh, let's say, account star A gets account alloc. So that has given me one of those things. And then I'm going to call init as well. OK, so this first line creates a pointer of type account uh, called A. This side allocates it. This calls the init method, and done. Now I have an object called A in memory. If I subsequently want to access the balance, I could either do this, A, get, uh, A and then pass it the message balance, because this is the name of the getter that is automatically synthesized for me. So I could do long, long, and I should do unsigned, so pardon the mess here. Unsigned long, long, x gets this. So that would now be valid syntax, because I got balance for free, thanks to synthesis. I could also say a arrow what? Arrow notation is used in a structure or an object to get at its instance variable. So what's the instance variable here called? Underscore balance. So I could do this. Don't do this, but you could do this. Or more simply, I could just call what? A dot balance, which is the preferred way these days. Even though you're incurring some slight function overhead, just as you are here, this is the habit to get into according to convention and best practice. But all of these work, and the fact that this works with the underscore is because of the highlighted line there. If I did not have that highlighted line, you would then get rid of this here. And now it's just a little less obvious, though. Is balance the getter, or is it the instance variable? It's more clear with the underscore as to which is which. Yeah, Carl. This, yes, is identical to this. It's just this is syntactic sugar. It's just easier and cleaner to read and write than that. Perfect. OK, so thus did we introduce in this ATM a model. Similarly, in project two, are you probably, or will you need to implement one or more models to represent, in the case of project two, a strategy? And the project spec in the walkthrough will walk you through this. You're going to have to implement for evil hangman, not just the old school uh, strategy for playing hangman, where you actually pick a word at the beginning and then you stick to it. You're going to have to implement an alternative strategy, the evil strategy. And both of those will be model classes that are presumably going to have methods that call, say things like, uh, that have methods that you call when you want to find out what the, u what the response should be to the user. User guesses n, you pass an n to this model's method, it's got to return yes or no, is it there, or something along those lines. But again, more on the spec and more on the walkthrough as to the particulars. All right, so this was the ATM. Let's take a quick look at the app delegate. There is nothing interesting here. This is essentially the template code, but I added some comments and cleaned up the white space. In app delegate.m, similarly, there's nothing new here. I simply cleaned up the white space. I deleted all of the stubs that I wasn't going to use anyway for backgrounding and all of that. And this notice is identical to what we talked through earlier in app delegate. So there's no magic there. In view controller.h, there is some stuff going on. So this is stuff that we did write two weeks ago. So let's reverse engineer how this code actually works. So assume it was, say, written by your partner. So we apparently have a few IB actions. An IB action, again, is a method that's invoked as a result of some user interface interaction, a button press, a pinch, a swipe, 
something like that. IB action actually is not some new return value. This is actually a little preprocessor <coughs> trick that Apple did. So notice these are instance methods, but IB action is not a return type. In fact, IB action is a type def for, if you think back to your C days, void. So literally, there is just a line of code that makes IB action a synonym for void. So this means the compiler doesn't know or care what IB action is. Rather, what Xcode is doing is Xcode itself is skimming any code that you write. Anytime it sees an IB action, it makes a mental note to itself to make sure that the name of that method appears when you click, drag, and let go. This little gray drop down menu of possible methods that you could invoke is simply there because of those little visual hints that you put in your code. So it's, like, it's similar to type hinting in some languages. This is just a GUI trick, and the compiler doesn't even know what's going on ultimately. All right, so this is viewcontroller.h. Let me put that back to IB action, otherwise it would not appear in that dropdown, which would make it hard to wire up. Show, meanwhile, is just a method that I wrote to clean up my own code, so I'll wave my hand at that for now. But now let's take a look at IB actions and these properties. So I need inside of my view controller a pointer to an account. So again, view controller is the C in MVC. This is the controller. I have a pointer to a model of type account. So here is one of those arrows from the diagram we keep putting up when we talk about MVC. Amount, meanwhile, is also apparently redundantly here um, so that I have a running tally of what the user is trying to deposit in this ATM. I could actually have another model and store that, but I decided to keep it a little simple because I just needed one simple little number. But we could factor that out too. Now here, balance label, deposit label, these are apparently both pointers to UI labels. This is my code mechanism for talking to the GUI. So I can actually read the value of and even change the value of those two labels. And IB outlet, take a guess. What does the presence of the keyword IB outlet now do apparently? What does it tell Xcode to do? That when you control click and drag in the other direction and then let go, the little gray pop-up window that we saw earlier, it's populated with a list of anything that was declared as IB outlets. What is it actually? Well, if you actually look at Apple's header files, it is just a type def for quote unquote. So it literally disappears when compiled down to that. So again, there's no functional change to the language. This is just an IDE trick to implement that drag and drop behavior. All right, so lastly, viewcontroller.m. So most of this is pretty, uh, most of this is just an implementation now of the stuff we just saw. I'm synthesizing all of my various properties up at top, just like we've been doing for a while. And now, just know for now, that this clear message is going to be passed anytime the user hits the clear button. So it goes back to zero, like a normal calculator or ATM. Deposit is going to be called anytime the user clicks deposit after inputting some dollar amount. And then digit is going to get called when, anytime the user touches one of the 10 digits, zero through nine. Should auto rotate to interface orientation is only going to get called when the user twists the thing around. And I just left that as the default. It's only going to work in portrait mode. And then lastly, view did load. This was that stub earlier that I've been deleting. But this time, I want to do something important. This time, when the application loads and I can see the ATM's interface on the screen, that's the point at which I decided to create an account through alloc and init and then I show myself by way of the show method. Um, so in short, this is just the way of getting things started. And it's OK because I only have one view in this application. There's no flip side. There's no chance that this view is going to be unloaded in this uh, part of the story. All right, so now let's look lastly at the nib. And let's just see what's going on. If I right click on an arbitrary number like 7, notice that a whole menu of possible events comes up. Did end on exit, editing did end, touch down, touch down, repeat, touch drag, enter. Um, notice the only one that I've wired up is touch up inside. This is the one that Xcode just presumptuously assumes you mean when you do the control click. A touch up inside literally means that. You touch, and then you go up, and then the event is fired. Why? Because you touched inside of that particular button. And you can sort of infer from most of their names what the other ones do. So this is saying that there is now a blue line from the touch up inside event to the files owner's digit method. And again, who's the files owner? What class? Who owns this nib? 
the view controller. So just to be clear, this is being passed now to an object of type view controller, and all of this stuff is empty. So if these are open circles, nothing's going on. You don't need to be visually distracted by anything. But realize that you don't have to just do the control click option. You can actually click and drag on these things to do the same thing more explicitly. So it's just another way of achieving the same result. Conversely, if I now look at the file's owner, I see different things. In fact, a whole bunch of things now. So outlets, I've apparently control clicked from left to right so that my balance label property, aka pointer, points to literally whatever that label is. Apparently it just has the dollar sign right now. Deposit label pointer points to this other label which just says deposit right now. View I got for free just by using this initial template. And now these actions all refer to IB actions. Clear is going to be called on this object when I touch up inside the clear button. Deposit is going to be called when I touch up there. And digit is going to be called anytime I touch any of these available buttons. And that's just induced by the dragging and dropping. And if I accidentally screw up, suppose I accidentally delete nine, the nine button will now not work in my application, but that's fine. I can just zoom out, control click from nine over to files owner and remap it to digit. And that will put it back into the list. So that leaves one last pile, this .m files actual implementation, which we skimmed over a second ago. So why does clear work in the way it does? When I click clear, it's supposed to reset the UI to zero dollars. So how does that work? First I do self.amount gets zero, and that is again the local instance variable or property that's keeping track of the running amount in the screen. Self.show is going to call my own show method, which for now it just cleans up the UI. I assume I factored out some code because I found myself copying and pasting a bunch of stuff. The Deposit, meanwhile, does this. Self.account, this is my model, dot balance, the, pro the model's balance property gets incremented by self.amount, whatever the dollar amount there is. So to be clear, there's a duality here. Self.amount is the controller's own long long that represents the current balance. Um, it's not the string that appears in the view. I have my own copy of the raw number. Then I'm going to go ahead and clear self.amount and then reshow the UI. Why is this? Well, when you type in like 100 and then click deposit, I want to change the top part of the screen back to zero but update the account balance in the ATM itself. And then lastly, digit is the only one that required a little thought as to how to do the math. So in digit, this is the method it's called anytime you hit zero through nine. So I apparently first cast the sender to a UI button. Why? Well, anytime you define an IB action, convention says to have it accept a pointer called sender to an ID. And I'm saying pointer, but you don't need the star if it's an ID. So you accept an argument of type ID. But if I actually want to do some button specific stuff, I'm going to go ahead and cast it, sort of C style, to a UI button star. But I know that this is correct because I did the wiring myself. I know the only thing calling this method is going to be a button. Then I do self.amount, which is the total amount being displayed on the screen, equals self.amount times 10 plus b.tag. So b.tag recalls a special property on a button that I hard coded. Seven's button is seven, eight's button is eight, and this was just so that I had a machine readable piece of data associated with each button. And what's the point of this times 10? What is that doing every time I type a digit into the UI? Yeah, it's effectively shifting the numbers over grade school style to the left by multiplying by 10. Tens place becomes 100s and so forth. And then lastly, the show method, this is again the code I just factored out. I, anytime I want to update the UI, I now need to check what is the actual value in these long longs and I need to convert those numbers to strings and I'm going to go ahead and use these string convenience methods that we've played with a couple times. LLU is unsigned long long, albeit reverse order there. And that's about it. So the end of result is that when I run this code, I get a little ATM-like interface that by default has zero at the top. If I first type in 164, notice with each key press, I was calling the digit method, which was times 10, times 10, times 10, and adding the new value. And if I go ahead and click clear, it's going to call the clear method, and nothing happens. State gets restored. If I do it again and click deposit, this time I'm going to do the math and add it to balance. So balance on the bottom gets updated. Top gets cleared back to zero. But this, is, of course, is not perfect. If I do 5,000. Sort of brings back memory of CS50 or whatever your first course was. So it's not perfect. We still have issues of overflow. None of that is hidden in Objective C unless we use special wrapper classes. But um, indeed, the functionality now is all wired together.
So what were the key takeaways here? So one, it's a much more involved application than that first one where we just displayed my name. But two, it also introduced a model, which is something you'll want to do for project two. And now we'll take a look at one last demo, which is just a utility application, which is the template from which you should begin. So I've created a new Xcode project, utility application. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. I'm going to go ahead and call this project two, even though we won't actually implement it. You'll see in the spec, we tell you exactly what to check here. I'm going to go ahead and click Next, save it wherever on my desktop for now. And now I get a default uh, template that's mostly the same to the single view that we've been using, but there is a little more. What's the first thing that jumps out at you? Out at you? Flip side. All right, so when in doubt as to what something does, let's just run it out of the box, see what happens. It should at least compile and run. So now I have my what's called main view. Doesn't do all that much, but notice the little eye icon. What's nice in this template is that out of the box, you already have an application that's more interesting than anything I've written thus far. All right, so how is this all working? Now, and just to paint a picture, the idea behind Evil Hangman is that when you run your program for the first time, you'll see the game's interface there. And we describe in the spec what it means to represent the interface. It doesn't have to be graphical. It can all be textual. But you'll have a button for new game and so forth. And then also an, a button for settings, much like this little eye icon, because you want to be able to control a couple of things. When you, in your project, click the settings icon, as represented here by this eye, you'll see the flip side view of the application. And there you're going to have two sliders, one of which specifies how many guesses the user should get when playing this game, and the other of which specifies the length of the word that you want to play with, whether it's one letter or 26 letters. And then there's going to be a third control, a toggle switch, that has the user turning evil on or off. And that will govern then the behavior of the actual application. I click Done. Control is returned to the main view controller. So let's see how this template is actually working so that you have a mental model for starting this particular project. So where to begin? Any such uh, head dives? Well, I would always start with main.m, just to make sure all is familiar. And indeed, it's copy-paste from everything else. Nothing very interesting going on there. In fact, under these other files, there are some things that might eventually be of interest. We mentioned this briefly two weeks ago. But a plist is a property list. This is just a fancy way of saying XML file. And you know what XML is. Um, a property list is an XML file, but that Apple's Xcode happens to render with this nice little uh, GUI-like interface. But this is an XML file being depicted as rows with data types. You can actually look at the XML file if you want with the text editor. Who cares? Well, we're going to give you a dictionary with, I think, 140,000 English words in the form of an XML file, much like Project Zero. But it's named words.plist so that you can drag it right into your project. Apple can then show you all of the words in this nice little user interface, which is mostly useless. But you'll at least see how it's rendered. But the upside of this is that now you'll have a chunk of data that gets uh, burned into your application. You don't make, need to make any network calls or anything like that to actually access this data. Um, and you can, if if you want, particularly if uh, more comfortable, massage it into some format like SQLite or Core Data or something else. But using a property list will suffice. For today's purposes, know that Apple provides methods uh, in the SDK for reading property lists and iterating over property lists and also writing to them. So you can use property lists as fairly simple databases that are just lists of things or that are even places to store preferences. Indeed, the flip side of this Hangman application, when you change these settings, they have to be persistent so that if you Quit the user if the background if the user backgrounds the application quits the iPhone altogether. Um, those settings need to be stored, and one of the simplest ways to store things is in XML files. You don't need to use SQL or similar. Yeah. How does plist compare to like a database of performance? Slower. How does it compare performance-wise? It's slower because it will be read serially from top to bottom. So with SQL Lite, Core Data, you'll get uh, more optimizations. But I think you'll find that it's uh, speed-wise, especially on gigahertz devices, 140,000 words is not a big deal. But there are more sophisticated models you could implement. Um, info uh, plist.strings, this has to do with localization. If you want to support Spanish and French and Chinese and all sorts of different languages, you can factor that out. You're not required to do that for this project. And this PCH is, again, a precompiled header file that just gets automatically uh, prepended to any of your header files. But you can also ignore this. So for the most part, you can ignore all of those files, but you will drag into supporting files per the spec this plist dot, uh, words dot plist. We'll talk about unit tests in the future. I mentioned them briefly earlier. But also out of the box, if you check the right button, 
and you'll get some unit tests or the beginnings thereof um, that you'll be expected to implement for the project a few weeks down the road. All right, app delegate. There is nothing interesting here. It's just template code we've looked at before. App delegate.m, nothing interesting here. It's just template code that we've looked at before. But notice key here is that the default controller to whom the app delegate hands control is the main view controller. As its name implies, it's the main guy. He gets control first. All right, so let's look at mainViewController.h. Thankfully, very uninteresting, except for one curious detail. What's interesting here? Almost all of this is identical to boilerplate thus far, but there's two additions. Take a guess. What words have you never seen before right now? Good. Flip side view controller delegate and also show info. So Apple, some person at Apple created this template so that you have a working starting point for this kind of utility application, which just means two sides to it. So flip side view controller delegate is apparently a protocol that's defined somewhere else that apparently this main view controller implements. As an aside, here's why that's about to exist. The main view controller, when you touch that eye icon, is going to instantiate a flip side view controller and then hand control of the application off to him, and then the, the screen spins. Once you click done on the flip side, that flip side controller somehow has to be able to hand control back to the main guy. So this delegate protocol is the signaling mechanism between main and flip that allows main to inform flip whom to uh, return control back to. So very similar in spirit to the delegate thing I did with RJ's help in for the dismissal of the UI alert view. So we'll see this delegate uh, paradigm again. Show info, this is just the method that's called when you touch the I icon on the screen. That's it. All right, in the M file of mainViewController.m, what do we see here? Well, this stuff up here, you can often delete. Um, this is, again, a class extension, aka nameless category that Apple has been putting in their templates for some reason um, to encourage them. But it's a distraction for now, so I'm just going to erase it moment, uh, for now. Um, odds are you won't need it for this project. View did load, view did unload. These are skeletons, uh, stubs rather, that we've seen before. This is a new thing. Anyone know what pragma mark is? Yeah, it, so the preprocessor directive. So this is a directive that's actually thrown away at compilation time. But what it creates for you, if you'd like to be uh, very impressed, is this thing here. So in the IDE, notice you can jump around to different points in your code very easily. Why is that the case? It's because Apple included these pragma marks. So they're little like checkpoints just for U, uh, UI simplicity. They have no functional relevance. All right, uh, and flip side view to be clear, notice the word up here. Flip side view in bold, that's why that appears there, simply because I def uh, they defined it like that. All right, so let's see what's going on here. So show info is probably the most interesting thing. Show info is what happens when I click this button. That method is called. So let's take a look. Flip side view controller, it's all kind of wrapping onto two lines here. But what happens when you click the I? Apparently, you're allocating a flip side view controller with alloc. You're initializing it with the nib name called flipsideviewcontroller.xib. The .xib is implied. And bundle is nil. We can wave our hands at bundles for now. And then you're assigning the address of that newly allocated object to a pointer called controller that's of type flipsideviewcontroller. So in short, you're allocating a new view controller because you want to hand off control of this application. Notice next, you're telling that newly instantiated controller that the delegate is yourself. And to be clear, why do I execute this second line of code? What's the point? Why am I informing flip side view controller of myself? So think of it. Mm -hmm. What's that? It's a whole different view. It's a whole different view. Correct. It needs to know how to get back. So think about this in C style. If foo calls bar, bar has no idea who called him. Right? In, this, in the world of C, if a, method, a function called foo calls a function called bar, bar knows it got called, but it has no idea to whom. Now, underneath the hood, if you've taken 61, you know that there's actually on the stack, there's a return address. But that's all uh, hidden details from the bar function. So in this model, though, if I click the I button, I better inform the guy I'm calling 
who I am so that he can return control back to me. Otherwise, you're going to hit the I button and the UI is going to change and it's going to be stuck there forever because it has no idea who you are unless you hard code it in that class. But that would just be bad design. Right? This delegate model is a very, very common paradigm in iOS where you inform some other object of who you are so that it can pass messages back to you in the future. So this is just giving that pointer to the flip side. Now, what's this doing? This is where the sexiness comes from. So controller.modal transition style is UI modal transition style flip horizontal. So ridiculously named, but this is an enumed constant that's declared in the SDK. So it's just a number, but we don't know what the number is because it's kind of abstracted away. This is what makes that very sexy iOS transition for me. You don't have to do any of the math yourself. Then lastly, self present modal view controller controller animated yes. So what does this mean? A modal in UI design means what? What's a modal window? This exists in the world of HTML and CSS too. Yeah. Uh, so often transparent background, but that's not what characterizes it per se. A modal window is one that, yep, Zach? It's often a pop up, but that too is sort of incidental. It's a window that requires your interaction to the exclusion of anything else that appears to be behind it. So there's the transparency, there's the pop ups, but these are all just aesthetic incarnations of it. A modal means you are forced to interact now with that window you can't still access as by dragging things around the thing behind it. So this makes sense. When this thing flips around, obviously you can only interact with one side of it, so it's modal in that sense. Now, present modal view controller, we can see that this could get very uh, less interesting quickly if I change animated from yes to no. Go ahead and recompile this thing. A lot of the things we take for granted in iOS start to disappear. And yes, this works, but you know, man, isn't it sexier when it flips around like that on your phone? All right. So in short, the show info method is what's called when we click that button. So what does that mean in terms of the nib? Well, let me look at mainViewController.nib, and then right cl control click or right click on the eye, and notice that sure enough, touch up inside is mapped to the method called show info. Well, now all that remains of this story, even though this app doesn't do all that much yet, is what's going on inside of the flip side view controller. Well, here's the flip side. I've clicked on flip side view controller nib. Notice that if I expand all of these objects, notice that I see a hierarchical list of everything that someone at Apple dragged and dropped onto this user interface. And I can start tearing this apart. If I really don't like the done button, I can just go ahead and get rid of that altogether. Or I can change the wording of it by. Um, actually changing the type of it with a constant in code or in uh, uh, interface builder. But in short, this is something that someone has dragged and dropped and prepared. So what happens if I click the done button? Well, I'm curious. Suppose my partner and not someone at Apple did this. Well, apparently, when the done button is clicked, it's going to call the files owner's done method. So that's some other method that we looked at. So let's go look at that real fast. So files owner's done method is apparently in here. This is in the flip side view controller. I click the done button. The behavior I want to induce is flipping it back to the main view. So what happens when done is called? I call self.delegate. What is self.delegate a pointer to? The main view controller. Because I, the main view controller, assigned that property before I handed off control to this modal flip side controller. So I'm passing a message to the main view controller. Flip side view controller did finish. So it's intentional that Apple called this method in this way. Think back to the UI, what was it? UI alert view did dismiss with button index. So this verb did is very common in this event handling paradigm where you want to signal that something is done complete, uh, executing. So flip side view controller did finish self. Now what's going on there? What is flip side view controller did finish? Well, notice in the header file, that is apparently a method that a class must implement if it has promised to implement the flip side view controller delegate, which was the new word that Yella pointed out earlier, was in the main view controller's header file. Recall that in the main view header file, we implemented not just a UI view controller, we also promised to implement this thing. What does this mean? Well, I had better implement, I being the main view control, a method called flip side view controller did finish. That is the method that's called to inform me, the main side, that the flip side is done executing. So if I go into my M file, there it is, and it's super simple. When that method is called, I simply pass to myself the message dismiss modal view controller animated, yes. 
And that simply flips it back around so that you see the main view again. So this is what's key about modals. You can think of the main view controller as literally being the main guy. He is in charge of everything. And if you want to see something else, he will temporarily present a modal, but control will ultimately be passed back to him. How? The flip side will say, I'm done. Go ahead and tear me down. And the means by which you tear down the modal is by passing to yourself this dismissal message, dismiss modal view controller. And the animated is just fluffy aesthetics. So again, the key takeaways today are not so much how to actually write these fairly trivial applications, trivial in that they don't do all that much, even though there is a lot of code and wiring going on, but these common paradigms where one object is talking to another, where one object is informing another to whom it should send messages back some number of seconds or minutes later so that we have fairly loosely coupled systems here so that main view controller hands off control to flip side and flip side only knows about its existence by way of that delegate pointer that we installed. And you'll see that just as this utility application adheres to this model, so do a lot of the classes throughout iOS. So in Evil Hangman, you'll have to start thinking about a few things. So one, you start with the utility application. So right out of the box, your thing is going to do this, which is great, because it feels like you're making progress. You can burn that onto your phone, show your friends, and you just have to finish implementing the game after that. <laughs> so, on the game side, you're going to have to implement some kind of UI. And it can be purely text-based. It doesn't need to be drawings and whatnot. Um, you can just use UI labels and similar. And the spec makes a lot of recommendations. But you're somehow going to have to model this gameplay. So we propose in the spec that you must implement a gameplay delegate protocol um, in two ways. You have to implement a good gameplay, which is sort of the old school traditional non-evil way. And then you have to implement another class called evil gameplay that has the same methods for gameplay. And we leave it to you to define what those methods are, but that's going to play in the evil way, where it's going to not really pick a word in advance. It's going to try to dodge guesses from time to time. And that's the one that's going to be fun to play against your roommates. So with that said, that's Evil Hangman. That's it for iOS today. We'll see you on Monday or at office hours this Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, in addition to the walkthrough on Wednesday. See you then.